It's that time of the week where we are here to disappoint you. The same thing we do every week. I was going to do a deep, uh, <clears throat> not really a deep, but like a uh, a deep cut into myself and make a joke about, uh, you know, disappointing sexual life. But, both of us, though? I don't know. I mean, I was just going to speak for myself. You can speak for both of us. Okay. That's, that's probably fair. the same. There you go. The Disappointment Podcast. Lucky for you. Welcome you to You can our- turn us off. That's true. You could just stop right now. <laughs> it's another week, which means it's the Gamers Who Podcast, your weekly roundup of news and commentary related to the video game industry and anything else that might pique our interests. Peaky McPeekerson. I like some new releases, Matt. Whoa. Believe it or not. Number one, Project Apodom for the PC. Number two, Agatha Christie, Hercule Poirot. Poirot? Sure. The London case for the PC, PlayStation, Xbox, and Switch. Number three, Daymare 1994, Sandcastle for the PC, PlayStation, Xbox. Number four, Goodbye Volcano High for the PC and PlayStation. Number five, Samba de Amigo, Party Central for the Switch. Seven day amigo. <laughs> Number six, critically acclaimed Sea of Stars for the PC, PlayStation, and Switch. Number seven, Under the Waves for PC, PlayStation, and Xbox. Number eight, Bus Simulator 21. Next stop, official school bus extension for the PC, PlayStation, Xbox. That's the longest title I've ever heard for a bus simulator. That is Bus Simulator 21 and not labeled clearly after the year it came out yeah it's kind of weird uh number nine call of the wild the angler for playstation and xbox we'd be fishing now yeah branching out number 10 it's a wrap for the switch do you wrap presents burritos okay which is also kind of a present injuries Okay. Number 11. <laughs> this podcast. <laughs> Number 11, Necroboy, Path to Evil Ship for the Switch. Number 12, Pocket Bravery for the PC. Number 13, Somerville for the PlayStation. Number 14, Tie Toe Milestones 2 for the Switch. Number 15, The Tenet's Pets DLC for the Switch. Are you a landlord in that or are you a tenant? I don't know. One way to find out. Number 16, trying five, a clockwork conspiracy for the PC, PlayStation, Xbox, and Switch. And number 17, War Hospital for the PC, PlayStation, and Xbox. And number 18, Starfield hit early access. So, well, early access. It's out for early access for one week and then officially releasing next week. It's half out. It's half out. If you, you know. Want to pay for it. Pay for it, yeah. So, hey, there we go. So many options. Mm-hmm. I've Lots of a, good ones this week. I've played a little Sea of Stars, about like an hour or so. We'll see if I continue. It, it's a JRPG that is in the old veins of like uh, old Final Fantasy, Chrono Trigger, that type of Super Mario RPG, that type of stuff. Um, and I think it... What's it stick? What makes it so special? Do we know? I don't think I'm far enough yet to have found out. Um, the combat and whatever was fine. I didn't have any problems with that. Uh, but like the first hour, it was just JRPG stuff. So it's story, 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 story. Is it a JRPG story? As in, like it makes no fucking sense. No, no, I'm not having to. I'm not having to like defeat chaos yet. I'm okay. not having to defeat a concept. <laughs> Does that make sense? No, that's a hundred percent on point. I think for... that's my favorite part about JRPGs is that you have to defeat an like an idea. 
you either are defeat a concept or you have to become a concept yeah, or like yeah. it's all you, this idea shit. You have to become the chosen one. What the fuck does that mean? The chosen one to work behind the subway, to become a sandwich maker at subway. Like, what are we doing here? Uh, oh, you must, you must, <laughs> you must stop ambivalence. What does that mean? Uh, Japan. Classic. Oh, I'm just like gassy. Well, that yeah, for sure. I'm just off. It is one of those days. It's gotta be one of those weeks, a little bit. Of... Yeah, just been one of those lives, you know. Just off my entire life. Uh, oh, I don't want to get depressive about it, but yeah, probably just should have been aborted. Whoa. Okay. Uh, <laughs> You feeling odd or even today? Uh, you know what? I'm feeling even. He's an even Steven today. There are a lot of new releases. Which makes me an oddball. No different than any other days. Exactly. Number one, two motorsport game staffers have won their lawsuits for unpaid wages. As reported by Insider Gamer, one ruling awarded an employee fourteen thousand six hundred doll hairs, and the other developer won ten thousand dollars from another case. The rulings come months after the staffers have threatened the studio for outstanding wages. The NASCAR Heat Five studio is facing other cases for unpaid wages, awaiting final decisions. One is set for September twelfth, and the other for September twenty first. Uh, the latter hearing is a case for eight plaintiffs instead of one employee. Uh, this news comes after Motorsport reported a loss of $8.2 million for its second quarter earnings. The firm said it had $1.4 million cash on hand at the end of July. The firm is also in talks with a, quote, known company, end quote, for a potential sale of its NASCAR license. Um, my guess is EA. For the potential known company that they are selling the NASCAR license to. Yeah, so, more... so I like your thought process there. Because it's a sound thought process and it makes sense as EA has owned it before. Yeah. And they're reviving their whole EA sports thing. But what if they went to Embracer? They could also do that. Who didn't spend X amount of millions or didn't have the investment from Saudi. So they say, fuck it, NASCAR. <laughs> the moral of the story is Motorsport Games is probably not long for this world. Maybe. Or, you know, it'll be more um, indie folks. I wonder how NASCAR handles uh, the video game side of it specifically. Like, is there a relation at all to the F1 market? Of I don't vid- think of so. Vid- of video games specifically, though. Like, is. Um... Hold on, I gotta finish this text before I forget about it. Uh, uh... I have when no. Because when I say that, I mean, like. Uh... Drive to Survive and F1 popularity has just been going up in, in the States specifically. Mm-hmm. It's already been big everywhere else. Yeah. But NASCAR was only ever big in the States and doesn't really hold any appeal because of how big F1 is everywhere else. Yeah. So now is are the two graphs crossing in such a way where NASCAR's live popularity in the States might be high enough, but its video game appeal is minimal compared to all the other racing games you could have? That are potentially more entertaining. Yeah, NASCAR has Formula One. The game is only as popular as it is because of Formula One's popularity and this kind of weird resurgence with sim racing, where it's like not not specifically sim racing, but the idea of sim like you know yeah, like yeah, sim ish yeah. racing. NASCAR doesn't have that. Um, I mean, they tried it a little bit during the pandemic. They did. Have, yeah. Like, their, guy, their guys do have racing rigs in their house, which is yeah. also, which was cool to see, like the mm-hmm. racing rigs that the NASCAR guys have. So I don't know. I think, I think NASCAR would need what happened to formula one in the rest of the world. Essentially. I think they would need that, but I think it's the, I guess they need, they need a rebranding the, is really what they need. 
and then for me the joke of it's hard to it's hard to mimic what they do in real life in a game from an excitement standpoint because it's it's not hard to say okay we're making a left turn here you know all all my typical jokes I could run out there for NASCAR compared mm-hmm. to every other race. But I mean to simulate a 400 lap race in a video game where you can game it a little bit to the point where you're just going around in a circle eventually has to bore you as a driver. I mean, without the way, actually feeling the, the like the G forces and everything else. The way to do it is to double down. The only, you know what I mean? Like, I could see it becoming popular in in the, the sim racing community if they double down, as in they made it hyper. They tried to make it as realistic as possible, so you have to set up the cars. The tire models are really like rough. They do have high detail, high force feedback, so people are fighting with the wheel and stuff. Like they'd have to double down on it being as like super realistic. So when I was at Daytona, fifteen years ago now, oh god, um, and I think they have this probably at other places and whatever. But I would love to see it in like a bar or like a Dave and Buster's or whatever. They have the racing rigs there, yeah, that they put you in a car and. They're linked together, so you know there's like four banks, and then there's also the AI around the track, and you're all racing together and whatever. Those would be really cool if they were more popular, like within bars, like rigs level sim seats to mm-hmm. actually just like we're gonna go to the bar and race NASCAR style stuff. Yeah. Like that would be very cool. That would be. The um, problem with NASCAR specifically, in as far as the world is concerned, is it'll never take off anywhere outside of the U.S. and maybe, no. maybe Australia. Even, and it even then, it'll be very hard in Australia. It one hundred percent comes down to real estate because tracks regular road tracks can be multi-purpose and you get multi-use out of them a nascar track you can only use for nascar yeah it's it's multi-purpose and then there's you know australia you're racing for f1 it on the street yeah they just section it off and like they've literally changed their actual roads to race there so it's not even they just have the room to have tracks that only serve one purpose. Yeah, I know what you're saying for that, but I'm saying like the ease of being able to put in an F1 track or other road race track can be done much easier if you have the infrastructure to just say we're shutting down this area of the city Mm -hmm. versus no, I'm going to build this entire stadium and infrastructure that needs to support this Mm -hmm. one thing. What's funny is a lot of the Formula One tracks in Europe had something that resembled a lot of them either started as or had a portion of them that resembled a NASCAR track and they were just phased out because yeah, they were phased they out. Were, they started being used as testing tracks and yeah. turned into professional tracks. Like, mm-hmm. I mean, hell even, um, Watkins Glen doesn't even do NASCAR anymore. I think they do. They started again two years ago, I think I mean, maybe, but like, cause NAS Watkins Glen is actually owned by NASCAR. Yeah, but like they sh- they had stopped doing it for a while because they were just like it, it's not. But even then, there's not that many people that do anything with that place when they're not doing anything. Yeah, I don't know. Racing's become so segmented. It's kind of like I I. It's it's kind of disappointing how segmented racing is now. There's no like, and even when you get the the Grand Prix racing, the racing that I like right after formula one with class styled and whatever. And you get the supercars out there. Le Mans is one of these options, but they're racing around F1 tracks or like the Nürburgring and Le Mans and all these other places that are built for, well, if F1 is not here today, I guess we could just go take our brand new, brand new electric Lamborghini and go nuts. Like, uh, the Porsche cup. It just, it literally follows formula one. Yeah. And you have all your other Formula One Formula series all in the same weekend. They just kind of like stagger a little bit. Yeah. I mean, it works too because a lot of these cars, there's logistics reason for it, obviously. But there's there's even minute, diff, minute reasons as in like 
the benefit of having all the all these series racing in the same track on the same weekend means the track gets super rubbered in. Yeah. So like it just makes the bracing better and it makes it better for the cars. But all right. All right, let's go to number two. We had a few studio shutdowns this week, so here's the rundown of them. Me, me, me Games is calling it quits after 15 years. The studio today announced that the recently released Shadow Gambit, The Cursed Crew, will be its final game. The studio will continue to support Shadow Gambit and has a content update planned to launch later this year, but it will be ramping down the studio over the next few months. Me, me, me said it is phase- paying employees a bonus to assist them as they look for work. So, it sucks that they're closing, but good that they're taking care of their people, I guess, on the way out. Yep. Awesome Knots developer Ronimo Games, Ronimo? Ronimo Games has reportedly filed for bankruptcy. An employee confirmed the bankruptcy on the developer's Discord server. Quote, we got hit by a series of unfortunate events, Lemony Snicket, while working on our last project and weren't able to recover despite our best efforts. Developer Volition Games has announced its complete and immediate disclosure. What? Immediate closure. The decision to close the studio was attributed to an evaluation by Embracer Group as a part of its ongoing restructuring program. Volition Games roots date back to 1993 and the formation of Parallax Software. The studio enjoyed immediate success with the PC games Descent and Descent 2, but in 1996 it split into two separate studios, Volition and Outrage Entertainment. Volition would go on to build its own name with the Free, with the free Space, Red Faction, and Summoner series, and in 2006 released the first Saints Row. Its last game release was 2022's Saints Row Reboot, which, whoo boy, that did not look good. Uh, Volition is also, I believe, thanks to Embracer taking care of their people while they find new jobs. Polish game developer Black Eye Games has announced that it's shutting down. The news was shared in the final season announcement for its title, Gloria Victus, and it was attributed to the financial costs of operating and developing the MMO. The studio added that the MMO servers will close down on Halloween. Fitting. Didn't even know that was an MMO, so. Yep, that's all you need to know. A lot of closures. Yeah, yeah. Uh, now for some layoffs in case you were thinking we were being too positive. Vancouver based studio Blackbird, Blackbird Interactive. What? <laughs> just, uh, just the way the, the, the delivery of obviously it's a terrible joke. And then just the, oh no, no, we're not letting go of everybody. Just some people. <laughs> and in some case, most people. <laughs> Vancouver-based studio Blackbird Interactive has laid off 41 employees. The Minecraft Legends co-developer confirmed the information in a statement to IGN. Blackbird was employing around 300 people, according to its LinkedIn page, with the layoffs representing roughly 13% of its workforce. A series of layoffs have reportedly been conducted by Embracer at subsidiary Gearbox Publishing. The wave of layoffs that the publisher started as early as June and appear to be ongoing, with senior business development manager Steve Gee posting on LinkedIn on Wednesday that he got laid off from Gearbox Publishing. These layoffs are a result of Embracer's restructuring program. Um, Image, this is a fun one. Image Dairy, Image, it's, it's a play on Legendary, obviously. But it's also Imagine. Imaginary, yeah, I hate you this got it. word. No, you got it. Um, it just doesn't feel right. Imaginary Studios has deeply restructured, with its future in significant question, according to a now former employee posting on LinkedIn last week. Imaginary was founded by former Blizzard artist uh, Wee Wang, Wei Wang, Wang Wang. That's a real person. <laughs> Wang Wang is. Yeah, that is Wei Wang. Uh, Wei Wang in 2020. Imagine if they were German. <laughs> I'd be like, Wei Wang! <laughs> I, I like that you not only went for the the correct <laughs> part, which is why screaming. the V's that I wanted, is that you went angry German. Yeah. Uh, the studio never announced its first project, but it was intended to bring AAA cross-platform experiences to gamers worldwide and was hiring developers for a third-person action-adventure game. The studio was also advertised by a blockchain-based 
MMO called Age of Dino as backing the project. So many layoffs. So many people out of jobs now. Yep. Well, you know what that means. Time to talk about poaching some talent. Poaching. Poached eggs. Xbox poached some PlayStation talent. Mena Satakato has joined Microsoft to lead Japanese partnership operations at Xbox. Kato will oversee global partnerships for Japanese companies at Xbox in her new role that she began in July. Kato previously worked for Sony Interact. This is there's so much redundancy in this. Yeah. Kato previously worked for Sony Interactive Entertainment as vice president of business development for eight years. She became vice president of mobile business in 2020 before leaving that position. So, Microsoft getting people that have had success in Japan to come help them. Yeah. They uh, seem to be in a fostering that Japanese business. I mean, it's it's somewhere that they have historically not performed as well as, as Sony. It's true. For obvious reasons. But... It's true. But, as we're about to talk about, Sony is intent in shooting itself in its own dick. This, a, this story better be great because that's an aggressive stance to take versus just foot. Uh, Sony has announced it will be increasing the costs of its 12-month subscriptions for PlayStation Plus. Uh, the change will be effective on September 6th across multiple regions. Quote, This price adjustment will enable us to continue bringing high-quality games and value-added benefits to your PlayStation Plus subscription service, end quote. All right, now for the prices. PlayStation Plus Essential 12 months is going from $60 to $80. (sighs) Cancel, cancel, cancel. Uh, PlayStation Plus Extra. 12 months is going from $100 to $135. Oh my god. And PlayStation Plus Premium for 12 months is going from $120 to $160. Oh my god. Bold move, Cotton. Hey, so Starfield is out uh next week for at minimum $10 for Game Pass. Yep. Just so we're all clear. That's all you need. Wow. I saw a a tweet the uh, other day around the time this news came out. Yes. Uh, Dick shooting was accurate, by the way. So well done. The, uh, The tweet's idea was essentially, has Sony gotten too confident? Too arrogant, too cocky, too whatever you want to call it. They upped the price on the PlayStation 5. They upped their subscription stuff. They've dropped the portal now. They haven't dropped the VR price. Like, they didn't put Bluetooth in the portal. Like, all these all these things where you're kind of going, like, are you guys just getting arrogant where it's going to bite you in the ass in three years? As you know, it's it's a cycle. It is. And it's vicious. It's, it's a vicious. It is a vicious cycle, especially... If you're people like us who consume video games and have, you know, in your case, a a well-functioning memory. In my case, a sometimes functioning memory. Sony is successful. PlayStation 2. (laughs) And then they're like, look at us. We're the bee's knees. We're the cat's meow. Where the whatever insert your fucking saying you like in there. And then they pull out their gun, they cock it, and then they shoot themselves right in the dick. Or, you know, if your case, if Sony is a woman, right in the vagina. Aggressive either way. And, you know, you get your PlayStation 3s. And then Sony's like, oh, fuck. We really fucked up that one. And then you get your PlayStation 4. You're like, wow, this is not bad, Sony. What the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> like, shocked they can still do it. And then, you know, you're riding high on play. You're just knocking out bangers left and right. 
And then, you know, you get your PlayStation 5s. <laughs> Which, uh, technically, they still haven't been... They haven't started as bad as the PS3 did. Because that's oh, almost, it's almost impossible to do that. No. I mean, and... And which is the true, I mean, it's, the PS3, it's a retrospect thing. I think when the PlayStation 6 is out, and we're looking back at the PS5, we're probably going to be like, that was a rough era, because the PS5 launched, there was no games for it. We're just now starting to get games. But that's they also raised true, the price. That's, that's and, also true of this generation, though. Yeah. Where 360 and PS3 are a little different in that yeah. regard. But I think, in in hindsight... We're going to look at this generation and, and think that Xbox performed better than PlayStation as a whole. Yeah, I don't know. I, well, I'll have to be removed from it before I think that. Um, because there's still a lot of things where you like you look at Xbox and you go, okay, what have you done? Other than like, yes, you have good services, but why would I buy an Xbox versus why I would buy a PlayStation currently? Yeah. I think PlayStation still wins that argument for me mm-hmm. just because the exclusives are better for sure. But, but there are, I think that's at like the top of the list. And then the if pro, we're looking, the pro con list gets very different, the further you get down, if we're looking in my mind's eye, ah, your third eye, my third eye, brown eye. The br- I'm glad I was also going to make a reference. <laughs> I was like, okay, we're both going there. <laughs> um, the plot line, the line graph for PlayStation is trending down. The graph for Xbox is trending up. Sure, I, I would agree. With in that. my in my brown eye. Now, I can I can agree with that, but I can also say that there is always the chance that when Spider Man comes out, yes, that that downward trend all of a sudden jumps back above Xbox. Oh, and yeah. you're like, well, that's weird. I just and think, then it starts going down again. Yeah, but I they, mean that's they, always going to be the case. I think at this point, their 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 exclusives are going to be good. Regardless. And that's the thing is that their exclusives can reset that line position whenever they want it to. At the moment, mm-hmm. at the like moment. they're not dropping, uh, like a Mortals of Avium is an uh, exclusive, and not that the game was bad, but like they're not dropping that where it kind of comes out and everybody kind of goes, okay. Like when they drop an exclusive, they're you're like, oh shit. Mm-hmm. I think the issue though is that Microsoft's exclusive engine that they've been working on for the past five to ten years. It's starting to rev up, and and that's that's what we'll see because this is the Starfield next week is the first beginning of yeah. that. And if they can somehow get Game Pass more accessible, as in you know this the fucking whatever stick we're always talking about, or is a, being alluded to some other piece of hardware that's more accessible, you know, where the X yeah. Cloud becomes more prolific or something like that, then. It'll be interesting. Yeah. Number six, Red Dead Redemption series writer Michael Unsworth has signaled his departure from developer Rockstar Games after 16 years at the company. The former writing director has worked on virtually all of Rockstar's major releases over the past 16 years. Notably, he's one of only three writers credited for both Red Dead Redemption Games stories. Unsworth is also credited for dialogue writing in Grand Theft Auto V, IV, Max Payne III, L.A. Noir and Midnight Club, Los Angeles, and more. A lot of games in there. Yeah, a lot of narrative in there. Uh, Rockstar's lost a few a few writers, a few key people, especially out of that writer room. Yeah, who when they were writing Red Dead and GTA, whatever, were said to be doing like sixteen hour days in office writing. Yeah. Um, I'm curious. I'm curious to see. Uh, I mean, GTA 6 will obviously be a good indicator, but the problem with Rockstar is you won't know if there's any effects for, like, fucking two decades because they release games so so slowly. Yeah, and, like, GTA 6 is probably far enough along written that you wouldn't expect it out of this one. Yeah. But I have the sneaking suspicion that um, Rockstar doesn't, they 
they probably d- haven't done a good time, a good job of of transitioning like they probably haven't developed writers and like handed it all along the institutional knowledge maybe so yeah the, might get a little brain drain the old uh transfer mm-hmm. number seven lenovo has debuted its own handheld gaming pc to compete against the likes of the steam deck and the asus rog ally um can we just take a second yep and i know there's a good reason for it. Okay. I have beef with the whole ROG branding. Okay. Uh, ROG Republic of Gamers. Yep. I don't like calling it ROG. Okay. What do you want to call it? I don't have a, a better answer, which Gore. is why I'm saying... Gamers of the Republic. I just don't like... It's Republic of Gamers, obviously, but I don't like that it's always ROG and everyone always says ROG. Like... We, you've lost the fucking point of the of it of the branding. Then just drop it and come up with something better. The only reason the only reason I would even argue for it is if they had one that said like Rob or Row or like the Republic so, of Businesses, like their yeah. other their other branches for their commercial side of just yeah, like yeah. Republic of Enterprise. And you're yeah. like, okay, I yeah. mean, it doesn't really make sense because you're. All you're you're literally just saying, yo, this is the gamer one, and you're like, what what does that even mean though? Yeah. It's a sticker on a board. I yeah, I don't like it. Anyways, uh the Windows eleven powered Legion Go launches in October for six ninety nine. And it'll be available from Lenovo's site as well as Best Buy and Micro Center. Its standout features are a higher end screen and detachable controllers, a la Nintendo Switch. Uh, the display is an 8.8 inch touchscreen that tops out at 1600p and a 144 hertz refresh rate. It can scale down to 800p and 60 hertz to preserve battery life and maximize performance. Uh, also announced, um, which is uh, this one's even more fun, uh, and it can also be used with some of Lenovo's other products, like their new Wired Legion glasses. Why are they wired? Which the company also announced at the same time. Uh, the glasses enable a portable large screen experience with a micro OLED display that can push 1080p resolution at 60 hertz to each eye. The glasses will set you back $330. So combo pack for a thousand. Here's my initial problem. That says it's a wired glasses. Yes. Then follows up with the word portable. Yes. So really, is it actually the glasses that can only be used with the Legion Go and not the other way around where the Legion I, is compatible with the glasses? It's a, it's a, I, yeah. I think the glasses have. I'm being I, pedantic, but you know. Yeah, I mean. yeah. I don't. The glasses are not specific to the go, from my understanding. So Gla- I can plug them into my phone, presumably. Then. That's the weird part. Is well, like when they're when they're wired. Like what? Um, is it USB C? Yeah. What am I plugging into? Yeah. I'm assuming USB C. One would assume. I mean, that would be logical because if it's USB. Two or B, yeah, or is it like fucking Display Port or something weird? You know, like oh, Mini Display Port, gross. Mini HDMI really piss people off. So, I don't know. I'm I'm curious to see. I'm just curious. I want you know reviews. Uh, if people actually buy these things, I don't know. Are they? Is it going to be one of those things where like, oh, the tech is actually good, but like. It's not worth it, obviously. It's not feasible at $300. Yeah. yeah. Um, but as far as the portable device goes, it's it's essentially the um, Asus Ally. Yep. Hardware-wise. Other than the screen and controllers that we pointed out. So, do you have any thoughts, comments, concerns? I don't. I was just pre-reading the next story, and I'm happy I got that one. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's a good one. Um, I... I I'll I'll preface the next story. Okay. This was going to be a one-liner, um, you know, a, just a single short short stuff situation. Okay. But then the article I came across include included a synopsis. <laughs> so I was like, oh, this just upgraded itself. 
Oh, here we go then. I'm excited. A live action number eight. A live action drama based on Pokemon will be starting in Japan in October. Just we're gonna, I'm going to repeat that so everybody understands. A live action drama based on Pokemon will be starting in Japan in October. You fucking buckle up for this one. The show's title roughly translates to fill your pockets with adventure. And will start airing on TV Tokyo every Thursday from October 19th. The show follows Madoka Agaki, a university graduate from a small port town who decides to quit her job at a seafood manufacturer and moves to Tokyo to join a small advertising agency called AdVenture. Everybody follow, I want to be everybody 100% follow. clear on this. Someone took an anime concept and said, let's make it live action. Anybody, anybody confused so far? Just straightforward. Uh, <laughs> Although she used to dream about living in Tokyo, once she gets there, Madoka soon realizes everyday life isn't what she expected. And she starts to stress when she takes on a presentation that could result in the fate of her company resting in her hands. <laughs> then it took me. S- <laughs> okay, I'll just. Then Madoka receives a package from her mother, containing the Game Boy Pocket and copy of Pokemon Red she used to play as a child. And everything changed. (laughs) She starts playing the game and realizes it contains something that's important in life. The show is billed as the world's first Pokemon human drama, in which the main character grows through their experiences playing Pokemon. I don't know <laughs> what the fuck this show is going to be. <laughs> I, I'm i 100% hoping that it gets uh, uh, simulcast has... on Crunchyroll or something. I'm, I'm guessing, based on this synopsis, that it has 5% to do with Pokemon. That's what, like, I was reading the thing and being like, when is Pokemon going to factor into I'm this? I'm betting it's one of those, like, she goes through a trial and tribulation in the game and then has that, like, aha moment in, like, a meeting in work and goes like, oh, I, I've seen something difficult. I know how to get through this. Or, like, those types of, like, weird, she plays that to relax and problem solve. Or or the same way that, like, in uh, Like a Dragon. Hmm that Dragon Quest is referenced when he's like, oh, this, yeah, you got to level up in life and you get experience points or whatever. Like, I, I wonder if it's going to be that same type of motif and not bother with the idea that she's actually catching a Pikachu and like Detective Pikachu in real life. The only other thing that I could say is that um, if we follow the anime tropes and, and whatnot. Oh, yeah. The fact that she plays Pokemon becomes like a... Uh, a way that she connects with other people. So like she meets other coworkers and who oh, play Pokemon. Like and if they go Scott Pilgrim style and she ends up in a Pokemon battle against somebody. Maybe, yeah. Her her rival at it, it, in the meeting across the way is oh well he's really good with this. Well then I need to use my type advantage of whatever. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Sounds like somebody wants to get funky. <laughs> uh Scott yeah, Pilgrim's so, getting a new show too. Uh yeah. Yep, animated show, right? Yeah. If, anybody, if nobody's ever watched Scott Pilgrim, and you're our age, you should probably watch it. It's, I think, for what it, it aged is, really well. Right. It aged really well, and I would almost think that it it's better now than it. And there's a lot of people in it oh, that yeah. you do not realize. It's fucking stacked. Yeah, <laughs> that casting is ridiculous. <laughs> For like, it's probably one of the most stacked, like films. Almost nothing films. Yeah, that's. The, I was trying to figure out how to word it. Like most stacked, underrated film. I don't know. I guess. Yeah. It's, it's around the time of Sarah becoming popular. Michael Sarah. Yeah. So 
he's coming off of his stuff. You're getting an early Aubrey uh, Aubrey Plaza's in it. Uh, uh, I would say Allison Bree. That's not who I wanted. I wanted um, Anna Kendricks. Anna Kendricks. Uh, oh Mary... my god, Captain Marvel. Oh, Chris Evans. No, that's America. But he's also he in is it. in it. Uh, Captain Marvel. Oh, um, Brie Larson. Brie Larson. Oh my god, I fucking forget. yeah. She's she's a <laughs> holy pretty, shit. She's a pretty main part in it. And then uh, Mary is it Mary wins the fucking Ramona. Uh, yeah, uh, fucking Ewan McGregor's girlfriend there. Yeah. Um. Fucking Calkin is in it too. Yeah, and. Uh, What's his name that was also in starting in a few movies that time who plays G-Man? Oh, yeah. Um, but he was popping up in a few movies. He's, he's having it. a resurgence as well, or actually recently, because he was on a TV show. Oh, okay, yeah. Uh, it's just like every everyone. It's it's kind of nuts. Whew. Um, now, yeah, I got, so, now I got songs from them stuck in my head. It's a good song, too. Uh yeah, so I'll try to hunt down this Pokemon show when it comes out, and I'll report back. I'm, I'm so intrigued. Um, Should get Amy to watch it. Maybe. Because if it's not going to be ridiculous, then it might work. Maybe, yeah. And if it's live action. And it's a and it's a live action drama. Yep. It's time. Rumor roundup. Yeah, here we go. Rumors. All right, so I didn't... <laughs> just doing that like it's a fucking Michael Buffer. <laughs> it is time. Get ready to rumor. Um, Yeah, so I'm not going to sit here and we're not going to we're not gonna be like this leaker or that leaker or this leaker. Unless otherwise stated, all these are from... Most of these are from people who have some sort of credibility with leaking. Like, guys, they've guys, been successful in the past. I don't like the term leakers anyway. Yeah, I don't know. It's, it's a weird term. We're all leakers in some way. I shake it violently to make sure I'm not. Just think about it. <laughs> Never seen right. a wavy, wacky arm inflatable tube, man? <laughs> it's my penis. <laughs> I wish. Oh. I wish. We gotta move on from that joke. Yeah, anyways. <laughs> Just keep going. A uh, Bloodborne remaster is targeting a 2025 release. The same source said the project is being headed by Nixus. Nixies. Not Blue Point. And that they are also working on Horizon Zero Dawn remaster. It's weird that it's not being done by Blue Point after they bought them, and then. So what? Are, what's Blue Point doing right now? Shh, 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 shh. Oh, oh wait, we know what they're doing. Last of Us Two remaster for the yeah for the <laughs> PS Five. The fact, uh, first off, uh, the fact that every Naughty Dog game is getting remastered. What the fuck? And the fact that they're also remastering Horizon Zero Dawn. Like, if that's uh, actually turns out to be true. What the fuck are you doing? Well, that one that one turns out to be true 100% because it's what they did with um, Last of Us. They moved part yeah. one up. So they're going to move part two. They're going to move Horizon one up. I guess. But, but I... then if you're going to... the My thing with the remastering of Uncharted is you need to remake them. Uncharted for sure, but Uncharted... Up to three. You need to do the first yeah. three. Uncharted, you could... You could make a solid argument, and I would say okay. But like Horizon and The Last of Us, like oh no, no, no. On, you know, yeah, like, yeah, no. Even Bloodborne, like I don't know if Bloodborne actually needs a remaster. Like the only way, the easiest thing they can do is they can say, "Here's the remaster that's also now available on PC." That's where they can win, win yeah. that over, and that makes sense. Yeah, if they're doing both, like at the same time, like in order to remaster it, they end up making it PC yeah. compatible. All right, that's fair. People would be piped. Uh, an astral purple Xbox Series X slash S controller has seemingly leaked ahead of its official announcement. Uh, here's a good one. Beyond Good and Evil 20th Anniversary Edition has received a U.S. rating from the ESRB. What about Beyond Good and Evil 2? We don't talk about that. All right. Doesn't exist. What's, it's not that, real. what's that terrible movie we don't talk about? Uh... We don't talk about Bruno? No, not the song. We don't talk about Bruno. 
no. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, there's a... We don't talk about Bruno. Isn't there a book where they talk about, like, not talking about the kid? Is it, like, in the title? Uh, I know what you're talking about, but I can't remember what it's called. It's We don't talk about something, but it's, like, a it's a kid? Yes. Yeah. All right. Um, appar- Somebody will tell me. Yeah, I'm sure. Apparently, EA Sports WRC is launching on November 3rd. Reviewers and content creators are already playing Forza Motorsport. A uh, new Pokemon from Scarlet and Violet DLC has been leaked. And finally, Jeff Grubb heard that a state of play is coming as a follow-up to the PS Plus subscription increases. You gotta get the bad news to then hopefully soften it with the good news. Yes. To be like, hey, guys. Because if they did that inside a state of play, that's all people would have talked about. Yep. Um, what? what was I going to say? I don't know. It doesn't matter. All right, cool. We're going to questionable things then. A new report estimates that mobile gaming revenue will reach $108 billion in 2023. Disgusting. That is disgusting. Despite being available on Game Pass and PlayStation Plus Extra, Sea of Stars sold 100,000 copies on its launch day. Not bad. They're pretty amped up about it. Nintendo has announced that it will release a Mario Red Edition Nintendo Switch OLED on October 6th. The hardware will launch two weeks before Super Mario Bros. Wonder and cost $350. Or you could buy a PlayStation Portal for 200 Or you could buy a Steam Deck. Or, yeah. In between the two. I was saying, you know, I was trying to make an ironic statement here. Like, this is a bad And idea. I was still trying to tell you a better value thing. And you had to come in with, like, you could either get a, a Switch or a Steam Deck, which is a good value. Or you could make a bad choice and be a dumb dumb. And no one likes a dumb dumb. They're a dumb piece of candy. They shouldn't exist. Matt hates lollipops confirmed. Number four, Arctic 7 has announced that it will be opening a new Barcelona studio in early 2024. Because I'm pretty sure they weren't just opening a new Barcelona. (laughs) Oh, Barcelona (laughs) 2. The facility will provide game development support and code development services for clients. Number five, Konami has moved the launch window of Sukaden 1 and 2 HD Remaster, Gate Rune, and Duncan Unification Wars out of 2023, as everyone was tracking those. They were, man. Number six, Gamescom 2023 had 320,000 in-person visitors from over 100 countries. For reference, last year's attendance was 265,000, so we're going to go ahead and up that. By yeah. Rookie numbers got to pump 60. those up. Starfield hit more than 230,000 concurrent players in its first two hours on Steam, despite only being in early access. Dragon's Dogma 2 will get new gameplay and information during the Tokyo Game Show, just in case you were curious about Dragon's Dogma. And number nine, the new the Witcher new saga, codenamed Polaris, is increasingly becoming the company's main focus. Per CD Projekt Red, there are nearly 260 devs working on it. It's currently second to Phantom Liberty, which the majority of the staff will be moving to The Witcher when Phantom Liberty releases. Elder Scrolls 6 is officially in early development, five years after it was announced. <laughs> Fucking stupid idiots. Number 11, Riot Games League of Legends esports division still hasn't turned a profit, according to Riot, and they're doing a lot of weird shit with like LCS and whatever, so tune into that. Number 12, Activision Blizzard has announced that it will be rolling out new in-game voice chat moderation, which will be implemented in Call of Duty Modern Warfare 3. It will be using a system that uses Modulate's Tox mod, which detects harmful speech. While detection will be in real-time, responses to code of conduct violations may take some time to enact. And number 13, 2K and Gearbox have announced that the Borderlands Collection Pandora's Box brings all of the previous games to PlayStation, Xbox, and PC on September 1st today, while Borderlands 3 hits Nintendo Switch on October 6th. Wahoo! So, hey, it's been uh, seven days. What you're up to? Uh, let's see here. Reading the book. Starting a new book. Ooh, new book. Yeah, Cold War this time. Ooh, yeah. Just a rough one. The I, the, I, the narrator, because I, I audio book while I'm working. He reads. He's he has no emotion. He's a computer. 
Oh, so monotone? it's kind of rough. Yeah, it's it's a little rough. Uh, it's interesting though. Um, monotone of relatively dry content. Yeah, coming out of Rise and yeah. Falls of the Third Reich. Yeah, yeah. It's it's it is interesting. It's starting it's starting to get in, interesting. Um, watched uh, the first three episodes of Ahsoka. Um, my overall review is it's okay. It's not good. It's not. I bad. think that's about the best that I've heard so far. Is that people have just been like, "Yeah, it's whatever." Yeah, it's the. Uh, I'm just you know I'm over the what what were we calling it at work? Uh, Filoni baloney, because it's a Dave Filoni show, and it's Filoni baloney. <laughs> Filoni baloney. Um. Pre-installing Starfield. So hopefully I'll actually play a video game for once in my life. Um, and that's about it. That's about where I'm at in life. Yeah, that is the uh, that is the kick because I gotta get that pre-install ready for next week. So I'm right there with you. Um, yeah. Got nothing else good to say. What have you been up to? Uh, I've been up to what uh, we in our podcast called the usual World of Warcraft. Played a little bit of CSR. I've talked about that already. Uh, I finished the three Warhammer books, so I think I'm going to get the fourth one and, and keep going until I I lose interest. Hmm. Um. So that's where I'm at with that. Starfield on the horizon. Hmm. A lot of football manager. I got back into my save. And so I'm I've I've been having that and like wow going at the same time that when I'm not doing something in wow I can keep doing the save. Um I've had the I've been having the snow runner itch. Ooh. So I can understand the After you saw that that snow plow, I understand. Yeah, it's basically what happened. <laughs> <laughs> Go to the state fair, see a gigantic fucking snowblower and you're like, you know what? I want to drive one of these. <laughs> Uh, I gotta go deliver. Some and there's cargo supposed to be that other stuck. game from them coming yeah. out. Uh, Expedition. Um, yeah, a Mud Runner game. I don't know what the release date is on that. I don't either. But that would scratch the itch too. I'm sure. Oh, I'm sure it would. At some point, maybe on that one when that comes out, assuming that it's hopefully it's on Game Pass, we should do a co-op thing and just fucking. I mean, Snowrunner's on Game Pass right now. It is. It is. We should try it. It my, would be my fun. My mental would be broken so fast. I think it would be entertaining to to make you play it for a little bit to see. Your, I think I would definitely do it with the two of us to see what your thoughts are. Because that's where like the key yeah, fun would, part would be is when I inevitably be beach a truck, and then either you have to save me or we we lose ten trucks trying to save the other yeah, one yeah. with some dumb ass complicated. Mm-hmm. I poly, don't think holy system. <laughs> I mean the game is definitely not for it's it's a it's a niche game. It's not oh, for 100%. Everyone. Yeah, yeah. But but I know what it is, so it's not like it would I would yeah, actually yeah. even get like that frustrated. Like I would have the enjoyment of like doing the dumb things where you I'd have that moment of just 5 minutes like I can't believe I fucking just did this. Yeah. And then okay, well, going to go get another truck, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> go get this one out. <laughs> Yeah, I mean that first time, like the first, well, the first few times when you go to do something, you're like, oh yeah, that's gonna be easy. That's easy, no problem. And then like an hour later, you're fucking three trucks deep, and like you're stuck, and you you're like thinking about just resetting, and you're like, what the what the fuck happened? Like, yeah. <laughs> but it's 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 having that same moment, then being able to look over at the other person and go, we're both in this boat now, and be like, ah, I'm not here, just hating myself. Because if it was just me, then I'd be so tempted to just reset and move yeah. on. Yeah. But uh, yeah, that's that's all I got then. Anything? Um, Starfield, obviously. Anything else coming up for you? Uh, n- if I remember correctly, not right away. October's got a lot in it. But yeah, not, not September. I'll have a new WoW patch next week as well. Small patch though, not big patch. Mm-hmm. Um, point seven. So whenever point two comes out, so ten point two will be the next big patch, but they don't even have a date yet. I'm assuming that'll be either in October or early November. 
I'm guessing October because I, I, but I can't tell if they want to. That's the problem is I can't tell if they want to get it done before BlizzCon or after BlizzCon, and that's the. I was like, there's no way they do it during BlizzCon, right? R- right. <laughs> when uh, when do you when do they announce next plans? When the patch comes out next week, I think we'll basically be able to kind of tell a little bit more, because then the next number patch they would push to PTR is 10.2. 10.2 is already there, but it's an, it's an encrypted build that people can't see. Yeah. Uh, so when point seven comes out, well, the next live patch that would start being tested is point two. Mm-hmm. Doesn't mean they'll be testing raid or anything else, but that means that the next time they turned that they moved PTR forward would be for point two. So it's only a matter of time at that point till everybody starts hunting and data mining and they have to actually yeah. have like a conversation of here's the next thing. Yeah. Yeah. Especially because they plan raid times and like raid testing and all that stuff. So we'll see. Yeah. We'll talk about it as always. Oh, as always. And I'll be playing it as always. All right. But until then, we'll see you guys in seven days. Toodaloo.